Act 3, Scene 2 begins now. We will be satisfied! We will be satisfied! Then follow me and give me audience, friends. Cassius, go you into the other street and part the numbers. Those that will hear me speak, let him stay here. Those that will follow Cassius, go with him. And public reasons shall be rendered of Caesar's death. I will hear Brutus speak. I will hear Cassius and compare their reasons when severally we hear them rendered. The noble Brutus is ascended. Silence! Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honour and have respect to mine honour that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. Now, if there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus' love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honour him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. So you'll notice in this speech so far, Brutus is very logical. He tells the crowd to be silent, to calm down, to listen to his wisdom, and then to think about it. And then he goes through this rather logically. Uh, it is not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Well, that sounds logical. If you like something more, you should do that thing. He makes a, a false choice. Would you rather Caesar were alive and you were slaves, or Caesar dead and you were free? Well, I'd rather be free than be a slave, and most of these people feel the same, so logically, killing Caesar was the right thing. He then goes through another list of uh, if-then scenarios. Because Caesar was valiant, he honored him. Because he was um, uh, fortunate, he uh, cheered for him. But because he was ambitious, he killed him. Again, very logical, very clear, very plain. And it makes sense. But is that all you need to convince somebody of something? There's tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any, speak. For him have I offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any, speak. For him have I offended. Who is here so vile that will not love his country? If any speak, for him have I offended. I pause for a reply. None, Brutus, none! No! Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital. His glory not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offences enforced for which he suffered death. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the Commonwealth. As which of you shall not? With this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. Live, Brutus, live! live! Bring him with triumph Homer to his house! Let's give him the statue with his ancestors! Let him be Caesar! <laughs> Caesar's better part shall be crowned in Brutus. We'll bring him to his house with shouts and clamours! My countrymen! Peace! Silence! Brutus speaks! Peace! Ho! Good countrymen! Let me depart alone, and for my sake stay here with Antony, 
do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoken. So Brutus leaves, and it seems that the crowd is on his side. They say that Brutus should be the new Caesar, that Brutus will be just like Caesar, but without all of the bad parts. It's interesting how quickly they are swayed by such a logical, ordinary speech. Mark Antony now has his work cut out for him. Brutus has mandated that everybody stay and listen to Antony, uh, but Mark Antony now has to convince a crowd that's currently on Brutus's side that uh, Caesar was correct, and Mark Anthony is not allowed to say anything negative about the conspirators. Let's see how he does it. Stay. Oh, and let us hear Mark Anthony. Let him go up into the public chair. We'll hear him. Noble Anthony, go up. For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. What does he say of Brutus? He says for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. To a best he speak no harm of Brutus here. This Caesar was a tyrant. Nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Peace. Let us hear what Antony can say. You gentle Romans. Peace ho! Let us hear him! Friends. Romans. Countrymen. Lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was... So, so far, uh, Anthony has followed his word. He has not said anything negative, and he has said that he is not here to praise Caesar, he is here to bury him, and that he is not here to say anything negative about the others because they are honourable. Now let's see how Mark Anthony is able to disprove that honorable claim without saying anything negative about them. This is my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He has brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff, yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. So you notice Mark Anthony is using propaganda techniques. He's offering questions uh, that have very obvious answers while ignoring all of the negative things Caesar did in order to disprove Brutus's and the rest of the others' uh, honor. He says that Caesar wept when the poor uh, showed themselves to him. He brought forth money uh, for the capital. He was a good friend to Mark Anthony. He turned down the crown and yet Brutus still says he's ambitious, and Brutus is honorable, right? By asking the crowd the questions, he gets them more involved and gets them thinking more emotionally. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause, what cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. 
Methinks. So now Mark Anthony is overcome with emotion that he can't continue. Why does he pause here? Well, he has to let people take some time to think about the questions and the, the problems that he's just raised. Perhaps when he's done crying, people will have a different change of mind. There is much reason in his sayings. Thou consider rightly of the matter. Caesar has had great wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Yeah. Mark ye his words. He would not take the crown. Therefore, tis certain he was not ambitious. If it be found so, some will dear abide it. Oh, soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. <laughs> now I mark him. He begins again to speak. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if... I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage. I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. So he, again, he refuses, and he says this, he refuses to say anything against Brutus and Cassius. But yet the people are already starting to suspect that Brutus and Cassius aren't that great. By making the people come up with the idea on their own, it becomes much more powerful. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read, and they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood, yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. Oh. The will! Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meet, you know, how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones. But men, and being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? Read the will. Yeah. Oh, hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will. Caesar's will. Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors, yeah. honourable men. <laughs> the will! The testament! The will. They were villains, murderers! The will! The Read will. the will! So you notice that by waving this carrot in front of these people, the Mark Anthony is able to get them to think whatever he wants. He's refusing to show the will because he would not want to wrong the honourable Brutus and the Honorable Cassius. But the people don't care about Brutus and Cassius, they care about themselves. They have a chance to see a will, they have a chance to follow somebody else that will help them, they certainly want to do that. So with this will, with this prop, Mark Anthony is able to bring the people over to his side far more effectively than Brutus's logical approach. And ask yourself this question, what are the odds Mark Anthony was able to find Caesar's will in the 20 seconds since Caesar was murdered. How many of you have your wills just lying around your room? Hmm? You will compel me then to read the will, then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Come down! I descend! You shall have leave! A ring, stand round. Stand from the hearse, stand from the body! Room for Antony, the noble Antony! Nay, hey, press not so upon me, stand far off! Stand back! Room, bear back, stand back! Stand back! Room, bear back! If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the Nervi. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. 
see what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart. And in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself. Marred, as you see, with traitors. Oh, piteous spectacle. Pope of Caesar. So Mark Anthony does three things again to get the crowd even more on his side. He puts names with the wounds. Does Mark Anthony know who stabbed Caesar where? Probably not. But yet he's pointing to specific cuts and saying, this wound here, that's Cassius, that's Brutus, that's Casca. By associating a name with a, an act, it really humanizes it. It, it makes you really uh, individualize where that came from. He does another thing. He uses words like we and us, not just Caesar. In other words, they're all on the same team. And Brutus and Casca and Cassius, they're the others. And finally, he gets everyone all upset just by showing them the wounds in Caesar's clothing. And then he pulls the clothing back and showing us a far more gruesome, bloody scene, Caesar's body itself. By doing all of these things, he gets the people very invested in themselves, in the tragedy, and very emotionally involved, to the point where they have long since forgotten Brutus's speech. Oh, woeful day! Oh, traitors! Villains! Oh, most bloody sights! We will be revenged! Revenge! About sea! Fire! Stay, countrymen. Peace there. Hear the noble Antony. We'll hear him. We'll follow him. Yes. I'll die with him. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honourable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honourable and will, no doubt, with reasons, answer you. It's interesting how Anthony con continues not to say anything negative about Brutus outright. He keeps calling them honorable and insists, well, they must have had their reasons. I'm sure they'll share them with you. We know he feels the opposite, and the crowd is starting to dismiss this. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is. But as you know me all... A plain, blunt man that loved my friend, and that they know full well, that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, Pour, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. We'll mutiny! We'll, we'll mutiny! mutiny. We'll I like this line here by suggesting Mark Anthony that he has no power to, con to uh, convince the people to mutiny, he actually convinces them to mutiny. It's reverse psychology. 
by saying, I have no skills, I can't convince you, he actually convinces them. Yet hear me, countrymen! Yet hear me speak! Oh, oh, please! Ho! Oh, hear Antony! Most noble Antony! Why, friends, you go to do you know not what? Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then. You have forgot the will I told you of. Most true. The will! Yes. Die and hear yeah. the will! Yeah. Here is the will. And under Caesar's seal. To every Roman citizen he gives. To every several man. Seventy-five drachmas. <gasps> Most noble Caesar will revenge his death. Oh, royal no. Caesar! Hear me with patience. Peace, ho! Oh. Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors, and new planted orchards on this side Tiber. He hath left them you and to your heirs forever. <laughs> Common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? Never, never. Come, away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place and with the brands fire the traitor's houses. Yes. Take up the body. Go fetch fire. Pluck down bitches. <laughs> Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what cause thou wilt. How now, fellow? Sir, Octavius is already come to Rome. Where is he? He and Lepidus are at Caesar's house. And thither will I straight to visit him. He comes upon a wish. Fortune is merry, and in this mood will give us anything. I heard him say Brutus and Cassius are rid like madmen through the gates of Rome. But like they had some notice of the people, how I had moved them. Bring me to Octavius. Well, that escalated quickly. Some person may read this speech and think that Mark Anthony let the people get out of control and he had no idea what he was doing, but we know better. Mark Anthony was very clever, very concise. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he wanted this mob to occur. Because while he can't control exactly what it does, it is going to keep the people upset, emotional, angry, and on his side, and uh, on Octavius' side as well. So now let's go to the final scene, very brief, of Act 3, where we see just what this mob looks like after Mark Anthony's speech. I dreamt tonight that I did feast with Caesar, and things unluckily charge my fantasy. I have no will to wander forth of doors, yet something leads me forth. What is your name? Oh. Whither are you going? Where do you dwell? Are you a married man or a bachelor? Answer every man directly. Aye, and briefly. Aye, and wisely. Aye, and truly you are best. <sighs> What is my name? Whither am I going? Where do I dwell? Am I a married man or a bachelor? Uh, then to answer every man um, directly and briefly, wisely and truly, <laughs> wisely I say, uh, I am a bachelor. That's as much as to say they are fools that marry. You'll bear me a bang for that, I fear. <laughs> Proceed directly. Uh, uh, directly I am going to Caesar's funeral. As a friend or an enemy? As a... Friend? That matter is answered directly. For your dwelling, briefly. Uh, briefly, I dwell by the capital. Your name, sir, truly. Uh, truly, my name is Sinner. Tear him to pieces. He's a conspirator. Oh, I am Sinner the poet. Uh, I am Sinner the poet. Tear him for his bad verses. Yeah. Tear him for his <laughs> bad verses. I am not Sinner the conspirator. It is no matter. His name's Sinner. Oh. Pluck but his name out of his heart and turn him going. <laughs> oh. 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 Tear him. Tear him. Oh. Come, Brands. Oh. Oh. Fire, Brands. To Brands.
Brutus! To Brutus! To Cassius! To Cassius! To Cassius. Burn all! Some to Decius ass, some to Cascus, and some to Ligarius. Away! Go! So this last scene, in fact, this entire act, shows us a few themes and motifs. Number one, we see that the crowd, again, uh, is very fickle. At the beginning, they all cheer for Caesar, even though they had previously cheered for Pompey. Uh, then they cheer for Brutus when he says Caesar is dead. Then they cheer for Mark Antony. Here, uh, they find a man named Cinna, and even though it's not the Cinna that killed Caesar, they don't care. His name's Cinna, and they just want him gone. The crowd is not portrayed as a very wise, discerning group. So you have to ask yourself, what is Shakespeare saying about large groups of people and how they think and how they act all together, all somewhat invisible and invincible? Also in this act, we see how propaganda works. We see how sometimes logic and reason can be uh, influential, and we see how appealing to people's emotions can be even more powerful. And then, of course, we also had Act 3, Scene 1, when Caesar is killed. Uh, what was to be the climax of the play actually ended up being secondary to the funeral, where we have these two dueling speeches. It wouldn't be a bad idea to end the play here, but it actually continues for two more acts. Now we have the aftermath, the falling action. How will Brutus and Cassius deal with this situation? They certainly didn't expect to be on the run immediately after Caesar's death. Will Mark Anthony and Octavius be able to catch up to them, or will Brutus and Cassius find a way to take over? Keep in mind, this is a tragedy. Usually doesn't go well for the main characters. Well, thanks for stopping by for Act 3. Again, please make sure that you are reading all of the footnotes. Uh, pause if you need to. They do explain everything very well. Thanks for stopping by, and we'll see you in Act 4.